now currently in private practice. Clinical director of the Paul Wilkinson School. A very pivotal person in the whole area of the black mind. As I mentioned last night, she was virtually fired from Howard University for thinking independently, which is not unusual. But she She has done you know, serious research on this whole question of AIDS. We had her at our, we run a, a holistic uh, retreat every year over the uh, Memorial holiday. A lot of people celebrate Memorial Day. A large group of Africans in this country are celebrating our flip. We run a retreat uh, each year. The last two years, we've been at Dr. Wilson come up and spend some time. It was a three-day retreat. I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. But she has been a person that has essentially galvanized a lot of people around this country to begin to rethink a lot of things. As mentioned last time, we're trying to encourage her to finish this book, The Ice I found you letters to Daryl Mark. She said, look how cute. I only you letters to that's the problem. I want you all to give uh, a warm welcome to uh, our dear Dr. Francis. Another vibration in this city where I was born. 
And I think Carol Washington had a very profound impact. And I like to look at events that we consider to be tragic and say what kind of lesson is to be learned from something that, you know, we feel is pain. And I believe that there are some very important lessons that we can gain from Mayor Howard Washington. And I think that his passing may be a, a test for black people in the city of Chicago. And the question is whether or not the people in Chicago, the black people, rise to the occasion to show Harold Washington that he is still here. But we can talk about that further. I think that the thing that we must do as black people is to begin to have a very clear context in which we do our thinking that events never occur in the abstract. They are always occurring in particular patterns and they are occurring in relationship to other things. And when I talk to black people across this country, and I've recently come back from England and talked to black people there, and I say that a clue, there's a clue to what ails us to some extent, and it's how we greet each other. Many of us greet each other by saying, what's happening? Hey, what's happening? And I say that's because we don't really understand what is going on. That when we really understand what is going on, we will be able to say like some other people, how do you do? But we are constantly saying, what's happening? Well, now I would like to share my idea about what is happening and the context in which I do my thinking and in which I understand world events. And that goes to the issue of white supremacy. You know, we've used the word racism for a long time or we've used the word discrimination but I am using the phrase white supremacy and in parenthesis racism, or the other way around racism and in parenthesis white supremacy, but the emphasis being on white supremacy. And I say that this is the thing that we must understand, that we are not going to be able to understand black male-female relations. We are not going to be able to understand teenage pregnancies. We are not going to be able to understand drug addiction. We are not going to be able to really understand the tendency to have trash build up around us in the places where we live unless we come to grips with white supremacy. Right on, right on, right on. So Maintain 
maintaining control and domination over the people that they classified as non-white. And when I heard him say this around 1967, a light bulb turned on in my head. It just clicked. That's it. Prior to that time, I considered myself to be a Marxist, and I was looking at racism as a byproduct of economic activity. But as I attempted to use Marx's definition, it wasn't producing the answers that I needed. And at that point in time, I was training to become a psychiatrist, and I wanted to have some answers so that I could help black people solve their mental health problems. But as I attempted to use Marx's concept, I wasn't really getting the traction that I needed to solve these problems as a physician. And so I heard this gentleman one day start talking about a book he had been working on, and he said, no, that you have a system of white supremacy, and that is about people who classify themselves as white being in control and domination. Well, I'll talk on this one. <laughs> okay. That, that, no, that's an echo. Can that be turned down a little bit? Okay. Okay. So Fuller said that this system, that white supremacy was a system, and that, listen to this, that this system functioned in the area of economics. This system functioned in the area of education. This system functioned in the area of entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Are you all with me? Do you see the difference? Marx was saying that this was causing this. And Fuller said, no, we have a global system of white supremacy that carries out activity in economics, education, entertainment, labor law, politics, meaning all the areas of people activity. So then Frances Wilson comes along and she said, why? Why indeed would these people set up such a system? And the question why is a very important question in psychiatric medicine. The question why is a very important question for the brain computer period, and that's why anybody who knows a little two-year-old or 18-month-old or, you know, probably two, and they keep saying, why? Why? Why, mommy? Why? 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 Because this is the question that turns the brain computer on is a question about cause and effect. You see, what is happening so that the brain can say, oh, okay, I've got it now. Now I can understand and I can move from there to understand many other things. So I said, why would these people do this? And then my education, starting at Douglas Elementary School, Wendell Phillips High School, Antioch College, Howard Medical School, okay, classmates or whatever. <laughs> that all of this came together once I raised this question, because this question just said, brain computer, go to work on this problem. And so I was standing in my kitchen, as a matter of fact, doing dishes or cooking, and the brain computer came with the printout. And the printout was this, that here we are on this planet Earth, one-tenth of the people have white skin. Nine-tenths of the people are black, brown, red, and yellow. One of the things that the one-tenth would say is that the nine-tenths, particularly the black people, were genetically inferior. How many people have heard that? Everybody. 
So I also understood in training as a psychiatrist when somebody is pointing, something's wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you that the behavioral scientist knows that the finger that is pointing at somebody else has three fingers that are pointing at them. And so I also thought about that and I said, oh wow. These people are telling us that we are genetically inferior, but the same people are genetic recessive. You see, and even if you have not studied formal genetics, everybody in this room, every black person is a scholar in genetics. Because all black people know, don't marry anybody darker than yourself. <laughs> you see, that's genetic knowledge under white supremacy because black people didn't like their color. And we're trying to get away from this very powerful and dominant color. But the people who were classified as white learned after they had circumnavigated the globe and everywhere the people were colored. And those white men who had sexual intercourse with the black women and waited around nine months, they found out that white plus black is equal to color. <laughs> white plus brown is equal to color. White plus red is equal to color. And white plus yellow is equal to color. So they understood after that voyage, after those many voyages, that these people, the black, brown, red, and yellow people, were the majority people on the planet, and that they were genetically dominant to white-skinned people. And they also made a quick brain-computer calculation that if they did not maintain control and domination over the black, brown, red, and yellow people, that white people could disappear on the planet. Now, black people, and this is what I wrote about in this paper, the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism that was first discussed in 1970. That's 17 years ago. I was a baby. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. But I needed to understand all what is going on to begin to make sense of this experience that we have. And being a physician, see, a lot of times some of the other disciplines, they can have a whole lot of ideas, but they are not required to get people well. <laughs> but when you are required to get people well, and you make your living based on your ability to get people well, there's another dimension it's not just talking for fun and games. It's a question of, I've got to understand this because when somebody comes in my office and says, Dr. Wellesley, help me with this, I've got to understand enough to be able to help them. And since I was trained as a black psychiatrist that black people didn't have the intelligence to talk about their problems, check it, and that the best treatment for them was drugs, and I said, no way that I was going to understand what the problems were that black people faced so that I could share that understanding with them and help them solve the problems in their lives. So that my having to understand this, but once I understood it, I said, oh, okay. Now I understand. The discussions that were going on before talking about black male-female relations, you've got to understand that those problems are tied to the system of white supremacy. And they are tied in a particular way. And they are tied in this way. Where's my erase? Oh, here's the erase. That if the problem that the people who classify themselves as white if the problem that they face is white supremacy 
for the purpose of white genetic survival. Are you with me? So th this is the key. This tiny group of people, this tiny minority of people on the planet are trying to survive genetically. And so their thing, a lot of people say, oh no, their thing is money. Mm -mm, they make money. They don't make melanin. <laughs> See, they manufacture money. But God makes melanin. Now, they didn't have it, and so their struggle is to survive genetically. Now, black men and black women, we are all equal people. We are not the same. Women are not the same as men, and men are not the same as women. The critical issue of white genetic survival is related when it comes to black, brown, red, and yellow people is that black, brown, red, and yellow women cannot cause white genetic annihilation. See how quiet it is when women are offended? <laughs> no. Women cannot force men to have sexual intercourse. Is that true? See, you can entice. Nice perfume, nice clothes, nice words. Entice. But if you try to force a man to have sexual intercourse, you're going to whip out your M16 rifle and say, you better come on. <laughs> and if you frighten him, what's going to happen? <laughs> See, now these are basic facts of physiology. It doesn't require anybody to make this up. This is basic physiology so that women cannot force sexual intercourse. Men, white, black, brown, red, and yellow, can impose sexual intercourse. See, I'm not talking about rapists, but I'm talking about they can impose sexual intercourse. So that the critical issue of white genetic survival comes down and attacks males differentially than it does females. You see, in other words, a white male can decide, now I want to make some lighter colored black people. So I'm going to have sex with a black woman. That's his decision. The woman cannot, the black female, the non-white female, cannot impose that decision on any white male or any non-white male. But males can impose this decision. And so because of all of the levels of color, black, brown, red, and yellow, black is the highest level of melanin pigmentation. Brown, red, and yellow, these are lesser levels of the same pigment. So that the white people understood, the white collective understood, if we are to survive genetically, we must impose control on men, and we impose it directly in proportion to the amount of pigment that you can produce. So that growing up on the south side of Chicago, you learn, if you are black, get back. If you are brown, stick around. If you are yellow, you're mellow. If you're white, you're right. Now, I was just in London, and I went through this, and all the people who, from Africa and the Caribbean just went right through. They know it, too. <laughs> all the non-white people all over the world, Asia, Africa, the islands of the South Seas, wherever, where there has been confrontation with white, everybody knows how the colors stack up relative to threat to white genetic survival, although people never understood that the reason that the colors had to be put down in such a way was related to white fear of white genetic annihilation. 
So because of that, because of that problem, imposing major stress, now there's stress on all of us, males and females alike, but there is horrendous stress on the men because the men present the threat to white genetic survival. Right here in this city, long time ago, 3149 Elvis, when my parents and my grandmother were in our dining room and they were talking about somebody had been lynched, I was a little girl, very little. They were talking about somebody had been lynched and they were kind of talking in hushed tones and I remember asking my grandmother, Granny, why did they do that? My grandmother said, well, because some people have to act ugly. Now, lynching and castration means what? To kill and to attack the genitals of the black man. See, I was wondering, well, what, what, what is that all about? See, black men may do many things. You've never heard tell in history of a black man attacking a white man's genitals. It's no history. It's no history of people of color attacking white people's genitals. But there is global history of people who classify themselves as white attacking the genitals of non-white men. So you say, why? Because the brain computer wants to understand in depth so that it can move with greater power. So we say, why? And we end up with this. Here's the black man's genitals. Attack this and destroy this. Why? Because in the testicles is what? The genetic material. And the genetic material that can cause white annihilation. Do you understand? Doesn't it make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> makes sense to me. Now beyond that, that as the white collective looked at the black male and says, he has weapon that can destroy me. He has weapon that can cause me genetic annihilation. So the white brain computer said, I must create weapon that can do same thing must create weapon, can do same thing. <laughs> must create weapon. So indeed they did create a weapon. And if you look at, here is the lateral view of the male genitalia. Can you all see it? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll ask for a model. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 All right, but look at this. Here's the front view of the male genitalia. Here is the lateral view. Turn the lateral view around 90 degrees and you have that. See, so if you turn this around, just turn it. And then what is this but this? That's a gun. Do you see? Can you see that? Oh, wow, they can't see it. Some models by Yes, I need a model. <laughs> yes. Does that help? A volunteer. They want a volunteer. <laughs> standing with no clothes on. You see his genitalia. You see two testicles and a phallus. Penis, okay? Now a side view is like one testicle and phallus and if you turn it around you can see that it is the same as the gun. Are you with me? That side needs a model. Okay. Now, what does within the white supremacy system and culture what do they call the gun? Come on, class, this is a workshop. 
the great equalizer. Oh, do you understand? This sin becomes equal to this. If he has a weapon, meaning the black male's genitalia, testicles, genetic material, that can cause white genetic annihilation, the white collector says we will produce a gun that will be the equalizer. And the people who are by law allowed to carry the gun, anytime they see a black male and they think, I want to kill him, he can annihilate me, then they call it what? Justifiable homicide. That's right, that's right. Are you with me? Absolutely. All for the purpose, not of economics, but for the purpose of what? White genetic survival. Now. How does this then come down and impact on the family? But let me say before I go further that there is a lot of material. If you understand what I'm saying here, there are many things that you will understand about the white supremacy system and culture that you look at every day, but you really do not think about. Most people do not realize, see we're getting ready to come around towards February, February 14th, Valentine's Day. The most important thing about Valentine's Day is that it's a day in the white supremacy system and culture in which they give out chocolate candy. Well. The white female likes the white male to give her chocolate candy. <laughs> <laughs> now, as black females, you see, <laughs> We follow, you know, whatever they do, that's what we do. We want some chocolate candy, too, without realizing that we already have our chocolate candy. <laughs> See, we don't understand that this Valentine, with all these little... pieces of chocolate candy. How many of you read the newspaper around Valentine's Day and see where they're talking about ooh, dark and erotic chocolate? Absolutely. And did you ever say, why? What are they talking about? What they are talking about is that within the framework of the white supremacy system and culture, the white female describes her ideal mate as who? Paul. Dark! Man, handsome. Absolute. <laughs> Do you all understand? See, now, unfortunately, Marx couldn't help us get to this. <laughs> Absolute. See, nor could Marx help us understand suntanning. Because while on the south side or the west side or wherever it is that we are as black people, children are learning before they learn to read. The darker you are, the uglier you are. The more color you are, the uglier you are supposed to be. Without our understanding that over on their side of town, they do what? They sun tan. Why do they suntan? Because not according to Francis Welsing, according to to them, they don't think that they look beautiful unless they have tried to make their skin dark. So like the children say, psych you out. <laughs> when they suntan, see everybody has cells in their skin called melanocytes. 
These melanocytes are supposed to produce that black pigment called melanin. If you have a deficiency of a particular enzyme called tyrosinase, the melanocytes will not produce melanin and you will not have pigmentation. But you can take those melanocytes and bombard them with ultraviolet rays from the sun and force the melanocyte to try to produce a little tyrosinase and then go forward to produce melanin, but that kind of mistreatment of those cells in an unprotected state will cause cancer. But people who are classified as white, I've read in the Time magazine where they say, I don't care if I get cancer. <laughs> At least I will be a good looking corpse. <laughs> You see, but in the meantime, in the meantime, because we did not understand their psyche, we did not understand what the fundamental issue that drives the whole construction of a culture. We didn't understand that they were feeling numerically inadequate. genetically deficient in terms of skin coloration and so they produced this culture that oppressed non-white people all over the world. We didn't understand it and we didn't understand them and so our ability to relate to them has been impaired. We thought it was all about everybody get together, everybody integrate little black boys and little white girls and little white boys and little black girls and everybody integrate together. But we had a very great scientist whose name was Dr. Martin Luther King who conducted a very important and profound experiment. He said, I believe it's a question of love. If we can show them how to love, I think it will change their behavior. But he did not understand the fear of white genetic annihilation, and he did not understand that if everybody loved, that white would disappear. <laughs> and so Malcolm X, he also was a great political scientist who conducted an experiment, but he was talking about not love. He was thinking about the bullet, so he had to be eliminated. But Dr. Martin Luther King, who talked about love, and because that would lead to white genetic annihilation, he was also killed. Do you understand? Now it is of critical importance that we understand this is the issue. How do I know further that this is the issue? How many people know the game of billards or pool? Everybody in Chicago knows. Come on, you all don't you all know that game? Sure you know billards and pool. What is that game about? Oh. That game is about white supremacy, but most people don't understand it. A white ball and a whole lot of colored balls are on the table. The white ball knocks all the colored balls under the table. Isn't that the game? But somebody thought that that game was entertainment in the abstract. Nothing occurs in the abstract. Everything that is occurring on this planet today is related to white supremacy. Everything. Everything is related to white supremacy. So as people who were in knowledge about what was going on, as they played the game of billards or pool, it was going into the white psyche, white must remain on top, colored balls under the table, white must remain on top, colored balls under the table, white must remain on top. And we're just clowning in the pool hall and playing, talking about what's happening.
It's just like many people watch, people in Chicago watch football, right? People in Chicago watch basketball. What are those games about? Those games also are about balls. And these are the balls that we're talking about. <laughs> Aren't those balls? <laughs> See, testicles are called balls. But when we thought balls, we said, oh no, this is just entertainment. And that's why it is reported that somebody interviewed Jimmy Connors, Tennis Star, and Arthur Ashe. And they was asking, you know, well, what do you think about tennis, Jimmy Connors? Jimmy Connors said, it's a matter of life and death. Arthur Ashe said, it's fun and games. <laughs> and it, you see what I'm saying? Because they were coming from when Jimmy Connors is smashing that little white ball <laughs> across that net with a white opponent. It means one thing to his psyche, it means quite a different thing to Arthur Ashe. But this is a culture that says what? Keep your eye on the ball. We think that they're talking about some basketball or football, period. No, they are talking about these balls. <laughs> these balls that can cause white genetic annihilation. Absolutely. And that is The ball games in this culture, and most people don't think about it, that there are two series of ball games. And I won't ask the audience, but the two series are what? Big brown and small white. Absolutely. <laughs> See, now people play balls all the time and watch balls, but they don't really step back and say, what's going on here? And the reason that I got to this is that one Sunday in Washington, it was so quiet. And I like it to be quiet because you can really think when it's quiet. So I said, what's going on? And then it dawned on me, the ball game. So I said, wait, these ball games mean more than we think they mean. And that's how I understood this. The big round balls are football, basketball, <coughs> soccer. So if you look at the soccer ball, it's got those black patches, so that means underneath is black, it's got a little white covering on it. <laughs> okay. Bowling ball, small white, tennis, golf, golf ping pong, ping pong <laughs> baseball. Okay. But these are the basic ones. These are the basic ones. Now, the men that are considered to be most virile play what games? Football. Football and basketball. Meaning they play. play with the big brown ball. I see a gentleman laughing so hard he can't write. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? See, this, this is symbolic activity. This is activity that goes on at the subconscious level of brain-computer functioning, where the brain is dealing with critical reality without talking about it on the surface. And so, the white collective looks at the people who play with the big brown balls as being most virile. And it wasn't always that you had big brown men who were the masters of the big brown ball games. There was a time in which white males only were playing with the big brown and playing with the small white. But they also understood what it is that they were doing at the subconscious level. And look at where these big brown balls go. This big brown football goes into some white upright legs at the end of the field. <laughs> Absolutely. And the basketball goes into a white net. 
and they're white females that dance along on the side. <laughs> As a white female say, my ideal mate is tall, dark, and handsome with some dark balls. <laughs> Do you understand? Now the game that is played by the most powerful white males is what? Ball. Ball. Little tiny white ball. Long stick <laughs> held in between legs. <laughs> and he's trying to get this little ball a little hole. in a hole in black mother earth. <laughs> that within the white supremacy system and culture, white men say they are not men until they have had sexual intercourse with who? A black woman. Do you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? Absolutely. <laughs> see, this is very important because if you don't understand, see, the reason that we're spacing around and quite can't get it together because we do not know the game that is on the table. We do not understand what actually is going on, but I can guarantee you the reason that a tiny minority of people on this planet can control the whole planet It is because whether they speak Russian or whether they speak English, whether they say they are Republican or whether they say they are Democrat or whether they say they are socialist or capitalist or communist, that is on the surface. The bottom fundamental line is white genetic survival. And that's what last week's activities were about in Washington. Because unbeknownst to many people, Mr. Gorbachev said, you got problems with your black people, then why don't you put them in concentrated areas? Like we have our people. Yes. You don't see any of the non-white people that make up the majority of the people in the USSR, so-called. No, that was just one white brother who was in charge of that group of non-white people. And so if you read your newspaper carefully, you will know that one-third of the Afghanistan people have been killed. Non-white people in the interest of white genetic survival. And so what we see is the big white brothers, the real biggies, now coming to together to work more effectively together and stop wasting all this energy pretending that they are at war with one another. Because non-white people are twisting and turning in different places. And it is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain white supremacy for the purpose of global white genetic survival without just out front total cooperation. Now this is a thing that we have to understand. And as long as we don't understand it, I maintain we will be making big mistakes. That what we need to think about in the analogy that I'm using is that 
What we have to have in mind is the chessboard. The chessboard, anybody? On one side of the chessboard, you have the white pieces. And on the other side of the chessboard, you have the black pieces. This is not a game about integration. <laughs> this is a game, it is not a game about hatred. It is a game. in which white plays one side of the board and black plays the other. But what is the object of the game of chess? Kill the king. That's a B answer. C answer. The object of the game of chess is for the white king to checkmate the black king. Why? Because white always moves first. White always moves first, so that white is playing offense, defense, and black has to play defense, offense. But you can win chess playing the black side of the chessboard. You can't win it if you are thinking you can ask the white side to give you some points. <laughs> you cannot win it if you think that the game is about the black king punching out the black queen or the black queen punching out the black king. You cannot win it if you think the job of the pawns is to punch out the bishops and for the queen to kill the knights. Anybody who is going to play championship level chess knows that the game is for black to focus on white and for white to focus on black. Do you understand? See how quiet it is? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Does that mean that we really are going to be required to get along with each other? That's right. Does it mean that we have to work together across the board? Absolutely. Yes, it does. This, to me, is the challenge that has been left by Harold Washington because he showed by giving his life the level of struggle that has to be carried out if a black person is really going to do anything. The challenge that we are facing is whether can we look at the chessboard. Can we get comfortable playing the black side of the chessboard to victory? This is the side of the chessboard, let us say, that is playing for white supremacy for the purpose of white genetic survival. And this side of the chessboard has to play for justice. Not killing and destroying all white people, that's not what I'm talking about. But there must be neutralization of a minority of people on the planet controlling the majority. If you say that you understand what is happening in South Africa, that is a situation in which there are 4 million people who classify themselves as white and 22 million black people. 
And when they say by any means necessary, we are going to maintain white power, otherwise we will lose our national identity, they are saying if we don't control the 22 million, that we will be genetically annihilated. But I can tell, see, the vibrations have gone down to almost zero in here. Yes, they are. And I'm going to tell you why they've gone down to zero. That once we are required to face up to what is happening, this is a very dangerous and deadly situation. Because it is my point of view that the AIDS virus was man-made. Man-made for what purpose? For the purpose of white genetic survival. Maintaining white supremacy is war that is conducted against black, brown, red, and yellow people. For the purpose of white genetic survival. It is a deadly game of war. All people who were raised up under lynching and castration know how deadly it is. All the people who are standing on the corner without jobs, all the people who are treating their depression with heroin and cocaine or alcohol know how deadly it is. All the people who know through training that men who classify themselves as white do not permit non-white men to look at them straight in the eye. Absolutely. Beyond four seconds. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now I can feel the vibes. Why do we have to talk about this? <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Because we would rather not have to face this. I don't want to face it. But the point is, is that I know I have to. My grandmother used to say about her husband, my father's mother, your grandfather was a race man. Your grandfather was the doctor, but your grandfather was a race man, focusing on the issue of color. My father was a race man, focusing on the issue of color. <clears throat> and they didn't send me to school not to focus on the issue of color. <laughs> Because there is not one problem that is going to be solved. There is not a problem that is going to be solved in a black household between a man and a woman if they are not doing the Nelson and Winnie Mandela pattern. Right. And what is the Nelson and Winnie Mandela pattern? They have been separated for how long? Twenty what? 26 years, 20 something years. But every time you hear their name, you think of them as being together. <laughs> because it's a black king and a black queen looking at the white side of the chest. Right. <laughs> In their respective location. And what comes about as a result of that? See, if I'm just trying to play house, you, you understand? Whether 
is male or female, just trying to play. White supremacy is coming in the window. You think it's a hawk, that's white supremacy. <laughs> non-stop white supremacy, day and night, non-stop. And if there were some black men that would testify, you see, because we are being required to what? Face the truth. The truth is going to set us free. Absolutely. See, we can get some witnesses in here that will stand up in front of the church. See, the church is just a place where they tell the truth. The church. The reason that I ran around is because I didn't really feel like a man. I was trying to get convinced. And when I got to the next lady, I wasn't convinced, and I had to go on to the next. But the problem is not the ladies. The problem is white supremacy. White supremacy says, no, you are not going to be a man. Now, I've already given you a model on television. <laughs> Now, the program is not there, but I've already told you, flip. <laughs> so you're not going to be a man if you are a man. You can cause me white genetic annihilation. I can't have that. So I'm going to turn you into women. Flipping back and forth between dressing as a male and dressing as a female. And then I come on down to good times. Good times is when you are not employed. Good times for me. See, just like when the Romans were dealing with Jesus 2,000 years ago. Jesus was a black man. The Romans, the Romans were conducting white supremacy. If Rome remained white, they had to be conducting white supremacy. And it's a clue in his name, Jesus. That means just us. <laughs> He never thought about that. <laughs> Jazz up, J E S dash U S. <laughs> See, Rome was coming in and saying, No, you are going to submit to me. So, white supremacy has been going on for a very long time. When they thought that the world just consisted of, you know, a little bit of Europe in the whole of Africa and the Mediterranean. White supremacy, white genetic survival was being conducted. Okay, but to go back to this point, that Jesus, when according to religion in the system of white supremacy, we're over here. You see where they changed the color of Jesus? Yeah. So that all of the non-white people in the world would not be worshiping their own image, but they would worship the image of the oppressor. And when you worship the image of white supremacy, you'll never come out from under it. And when you look at, like I went to Olivet Baptist Church, Quinn Chapel AME Church, baptized in one, christened in the other, in the little Sunday school cars. How many people saw the little Sunday school cars? 
and the picture of Jesus that is in your brain and it will not come out. You see, but your brain computer has already made the calculation. If that's the Son of God, God must be white. See, but probably if I ask what color is God, God doesn't have a color, ask your computer. <laughs> See, I can give everybody a test. Say, close your eyes and I'm going to say a word. And you check the image that comes across the screen in your brain computer. Close your eyes, everybody. Eyes closed tight. Okay, here's the word. Jesus. <laughs> So you didn't see an image that looked like any of the black men in this room. You said, that's not Jesus. That's not my Jesus. <laughs> Do you all understand? See, this a system. A system is made to turn out a particular product. This particular system has been designed for the purpose of white genetic survival. And so it is a system of programming the brain computer in all of these areas of activity to achieve this objective. Now what we have to do is decode the game that is on the table. Just like if you don't play chess, you can sit down a long time and watch two people who are playing and then figure out exactly what the game is. And so what we are talking about is understanding the game that is on the table decoding the system of white supremacy, reorganizing behavior from being victims of white supremacy, turning it into people who will be able to neutralize and checkmate white supremacy. But it will take understanding, understanding that we are afraid to deal with white supremacy. I'm going to tell you, I'm proof right here. You can lose your job talking about white supremacy. <laughs> You can make a whole lot of people who don't even know you think they don't like you. Because you dare to talk about white supremacy. This is the game that is on the table. Everything else is fluff. But by focusing on this, any man and woman who want to improve their relationship focus on white supremacy. See, any woman that thinks man is a problem, focus on white supremacy. Any man that thinks a black woman is a problem, Focus on white supremacy. There's a problem that is 10 trillion times greater for you than any non-white female that you've ever encountered on the planet. <laughs> and if, see, by looking at this side of the chessboard, which will require courage, and the use of courage will produce self-respect, and when we are in self-respect, for example, if I, Francis Wilson, said, I can't stand me, I can't stand black men, what would my self-respect score be max? Zero. No, it wouldn't be zero. It would be at max 50%. Why? Because I am produced by a mother and a father. Without my father, I could not be standing here. So if I say I hate half of myself. I hate me. Then my self-respect score will be 50 at max, and my self-defense score will also be 50. And anybody growing up in Chicago public schools know that 50 is not passed. 
You see, so I would be in a failed state of self-respect. This is very critical. It is important for men. It is important for women. A man saying, I, I hate black women. I hate black women. His self-respect score at max can only be 50. And he will eventually engage in self-destructive behavior, and she will engage in self-destructive behavior, and white supremacy will say, right on. See, this is of critical importance because white supremacy said, now what I'm going to do is that it's very difficult to maintain control with guns all the time. I have to have a much more efficient and effective manner to achieve what I need to achieve. So white supremacy says, now if I don't, it's of critical importance that the men not function at their maximal level because that will cause me white genetic annihilation. So if I cripple the man so that he cannot play that essential role of breadwinning. I can make any woman that he relates to hate him because he's not able to help her. If I don't employ him, then he will have to go back to the definition of self that I gave him during the phase of slavery. See, I will make him continue studying and then I will make his children hate him because he's producing that which he cannot take care of. Do you all understand? Absolutely. See, it's just a fantastic puzzle. All the pieces fit smoothly together. If I don't employ him, I will make his wife hate him. And then when she touches the male child, she will destroy masculinity. So that the little boy will say, Mommy, put something in there, polish on my nails too. Okay, honey. Let me try your high heel shoes. Okay. Now this is the youngest son. The older child, there you go acting like that. No, 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 no. Do you all understand? Yeah. He's not bad, she's not bad. White supremacy understands what it's doing. Now I have, somebody raised a question in the last set. well what about homosexuality? White supremacy makes homosexuality. Homosexuality was not a form of sexual expression in Africa. It was the dominant form of sexual expression in Greece and Rome. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. What was going on? I say what was going on is this. Here's the big giant continent of Africa. All these black people. Some people play black Africa. The whole of Africa is black. <laughs> Over here, the Mediterranean, here's Italy, little tiny countries, <laughs> Europe. <laughs> so these little men over here, white, saw these giants over here, black. And they probably start saying, who has the biggest penis way back then? <laughs> Oh, 
Absolutely. <laughs> so I say that the men on the northern side of the Mediterranean said, Gosh. <laughs> they can genetically annihilate me. And I think it's also bigger. <laughs> so then these men, feeling an inadequacy of masculinity and manhood, started engaging in behavior, what kind of behavior? See, male homosexual behavior is what? Putting the penis in the mouth or putting it in the anus. The mouth and the anus are opposite ends of the gastrointestinal tract. <laughs> this is the tract that we use to feed the body. So if the body is feeling a deficiency in masculinity, it will occur to the brain computer, I need some vitamin masculinity Absolutely. called semen. Did you get that? Absolutely. See, it's just like if your body is missing a particular substance, you say, I think I need some green. That's, that's true. You see, without understanding what particular mineral you are in search of. <laughs> and so this over here started putting penis in mouth and penis in anus because compared to these men, they felt masculine deficient. But under the conditions of white supremacy that had to attack black masculinity for the purpose of what? White genetic survival. So they said, well, now these men haven't been accustomed to these practices, but I'm taking masculinity away from them. I'm conquering them, and I'm taking masculinity away. Now, any men, I'm looking and see some men looking to the right and looking to the left and not looking forward. Don't be upset. Don't be upset. The strongest men in this room are those who can say, we have been conquered by the oppressor. I am glad to announce, yes, we have been conquered. If the Bears lose a football game, do they have a problem saying we lost that one? See, actually, if the brain computer believes in the potential that is there, one can say, we've lost the last many tournaments. It just means that we have to study the field or study the board. It doesn't mean turn around. and run from the reality. So that the challenge for the rest of the 1980s is can we face the reality? See, you don't enslave a people who have not been beaten. We were beaten. They were running quite genetic survival, and I can even go further back in the story than that. Because what I believe happened was black people were the first people on the planet. 
Everybody with that? At some point in time, black people start producing albino mutants, and any black person can produce an albino mutant, somebody who doesn't have color. All they have to do is have a genetic mutation in the production of melanin. So for some reason, there were some albinos being produced in Africa, and the Africans put them out. In the same way that if a person, a baby is born genetic defective, they put the baby in an institution. So the African people put the white babies out. And the babies are up here in Europe. Across the Sahara, across the burning sands, up here in Europe. And then they collected together over a long period of time and then they came back and started raising hell. You see, causing is like, and then what do they say about the founding of Rome? Rome was found by who? Romulus and Remus. The little white babies who were suckling on a wolf. Because what? Mother and father had put them out. And so then they circle back around and take mother and father out of Africa and bring them over to the New World and say, now you're going to nurse a little white baby. Do you understand? And then they call the black woman mammy, and uncle and auntie. Do you all understand? I'm talking about what seems to be the flow of history, but here we are. Now injustice has been established. And we are the victims of injustice who must rise to the occasion facing truth and fix things right again. We must understand, we must understand. You see, because after they enslaved us and destroyed the black family and said, you're not gonna function. And so we are in a state of dysfunction. The majority of black children are in what? Single parent households. We have huge numbers of children that are producing children. No child can rear a child to be a soldier. No child. can rear a child to be a soldier. And if you bring children in the world and you can't take care of them so they're passed from one foster home to another foster home to another foster home to another foster home, not only are you making children who are going to become drug addicts and alcoholics, but you are setting up children to be sexually abused. And I am telling you, if anybody in this room doesn't understand what is happening to children who have been, what? Produced without responsibility. That these children are being dogged and degraded, it will make the strongest man cry if he dared to read the history. It is a living, crying shame what is happening to hundreds of thousands of black children under white supremacy. But white supremacy is not going to change it. It is up to black people to study the chessboard and say never another black child is going to be born to a child. Never another black child is going to be born and then given away to the slave master and say, you raise it. Do you all understand what I'm saying? I'm saying, my view, no black woman should have a child until she's 30.
No black man should become a father until he's 35. No more than two. No closer together than three years apart. Why? Because we are going to win this war. All right. But if children do not have mature parents, see now white supremacy say you're not going to have any mature parents. This is a war. I'm not letting you all have any mature parents if I have anything to say about it. I want you to produce weak people. I want you to produce children that are not taken care of so I can sell drugs to them and look at them falling all over the street. I want to produce men that can't fight the war. I want to look at it and feel strong and powerful and white. No, this is what we are up against. So it's a big game that is on the field. It's not about, I'm going to do my own thing. You don't go on a football field, I'm going to do my own thing, and the coach says, get off the field. You don't go on a basketball court, I'm going to do my own thing. You don't even sit down with checkers, I'm going to do my own thing. No, you play the game that is on the table. We are being required to play this game of justice against white supremacy. It cannot be done with weak people. It cannot be done with children who do not get their lap time. See, lap time, I asked some children, what is lap time? How many times you run around the field? <laughs> no, lap time is the time that little children require to get their emotional bearing by being able to sit on a mature lap and not have somebody say, get down, boy, get down, you're too big. Get down, girl, get off of my lap. You see, I got this baby. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the conditions have been produced because if you don't give children lap time, they will become obsessed with sex. Did you get it? I got to have some. I got, I got to, I got to have some. I got to get me some. House is burning. I got to get some. <laughs> Seriously. See, if you don't meet the emotional needs, if mature parents are not available, children will look for a sexual outlet to be close. Little teenage girl, I want to have a baby, Dr. Wilson. I can take care of this baby. She's 13. I'm going to love this baby. This baby's going to love me. Little boy and little girl, if you love me, you're going to have my baby. Yeah, I'm going to have a baby for you. Little boy wants to be loved. Little girl wants to be loved under the conditions of white supremacy. It is going to be a disaster. Children who do not get their emotional needs met cannot sit still in the first grade. And then somebody will say, oh, he's hyperactive. I think we need to put him on medication. Do you all understand? Absolutely. Somebody with the first child is 14, and by the time they're 22, is six children. Do you understand? She's overwhelmed. It is no way possible 
for somebody 22 to meet the emotional needs of two children. Do you, do you understand? We must master what has happened to us under white supremacy. We are not dumb, we are not stupid, but a war machine has rolled over us. A war machine that now includes AIDS. Oh, it started in Africa. <laughs> Oh, the green monkey. It started in a laboratory. Is this like when the stock market fell because of whatever people who classify themselves as white were doing or failing to do? They said it was Black Monday. <laughs> so when they manufacture a virus, that is specifically for the purpose of depopulating. I have to reduce the numbers of black people because it is too much for me to deal with. So if I just gave it to them straight, then they would say, oh, wait a minute, how come only black people have it? So what I'm going to do is give it to the white homosexuals who I think are weak white men, and so I can get rid of them, and then it'll look like it's a black white thing too. So people who study history will say, wait a minute, isn't that the same plan that Hitler had? Before Hitler destroyed six million Semites of the Jewish religion because he said they were not white people. And he took the white homosexuals out in front. We have exactly. The same dynamic going on that went on in Nazi Germany. Hitler backed up trucks to the mental institutions and gassed those people. What do we do? We're going to let them out and let them walk around the streets where they don't have shelter, don't have decent food. And so within about four years, many of them will be dead. Get the variation on the theme all kind of homeless people with no place to live. So we have the same dynamic that is coming down here that went down in Germany under their particular situation of white supremacy. No education being done amongst black people. I called Surgeon General Coop's office a year ago I said, you all keep talking about large numbers of black people are going to have AIDS. And I said, but you are not educating in a public health manner. You are not educating black people. You have to go on the television over and over again. You have to go on the radio that black people listen to over and over again and educate them about AIDS. The spokeswoman in his office said, well, it's too bad. Some people just won't find out. And I said, I cannot believe you're saying this to me. And there was silence on the other end. In London, the black people are not...
being educated about AIDS. In this area of the world, the black people are not being educated about AIDS. And if you read the newspaper, I look at three newspapers every day. And if you look at the newspapers and read, you will see what they're saying. Oh, well, we won't be able to reach the drug addicts. Now, that's an impossible population. You just can't reach them. That's not true. You take a sound truck if you want to. And you can go and educate them. After every soap opera, you can have educational information, not about condoms. No, they said they brought the condom issue so they wouldn't have to educate. They want us to talk about condoms, and so then they will have a big side distracting argument going on about condoms so that they do not do public health education. The way that I know that AIDS is biological warfare is because there's no education that is going on. If it was a real public health disaster, it would be all kinds of education going on. And I found a book in February of 1987 called A Survey of Chemical and Biological Warfare, in which they describe a disease. The book was published in 1969. And they describe a disease exactly like AIDS. It's called green monkey disease, vervet monkey disease. Can be venereally transmitted, unlike any other. organism can be used for biological warfare purposes. It said that right in the book. Now here comes this green monkey again with the same disease that they're saying just came out of the blue in Africa. I say wake up black people. Demonstrate your self-respect by being courageous, looking at the truth, be willing to change your behavior. Many black people that I talk to, have you changed your behavior in the presence of AIDS? No. I'm telling you now. Anybody who doesn't change their behavior is going to be dead. If I was a white supremacist, I would say, now there is a form of sex called safe sex. If you use a condom, then you lower your chances of getting this deadly virus. But what would I do further to do? I put holes in the condoms in your community. And do you know, I was talking at a Unitarian church to some people a week ago, and I was saying this. And so two people that I was talking to said, didn't you see the article where they found all these condoms that had holes in them? That's why it's important to understand. Is this biological warfare? If you think it's just economics, you won't understand white genetic survival, and you won't understand when the brain computer that is concerned about white genetic survival will be pushed to say we have to we have to use germ warfare on these people. You won't even understand it. If you don't understand white genetic survival, you won't understand how they could calculate to destroy six million who look to us like they were white. But they said, no, they are not white. 
They came out of Africa. They are a mixture of Greek and Roman soldiers and African women. They miscegenated for close to 2,000 years with white people, lost a lot of their color, but the white people said they still are not white. We just had a case of a lady in New Orleans, right? Who said, well, I'm white, 